In a world of EMS podcasters, EMS Office Hours is the only live podcast bringing you the latest topics and opinions in EMS. Turn down your scanner and turn up your speakers as we join Jim Hoffman and Josh Knapp on their latest EMS podcasting journey. Hey, welcome to EMS Office Hours. Uh, this is Jim Hoffman. And Josh Knapp. And today we are uh, joined by Dr. Paul Lewis. Uh, Dr. Lewis, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me on the show, guys. Thank you. Well, right, so- you know, we got to do something to boost the intellectual uh, component yeah, of this show. Exactly. So. You got the wrong guy here, man. <laughs> <laughs> so... We have it. I'm going to play a video uh, in a few few minutes here, uh, Dr. Lewis. But basically, we're here to talk about a safety net, right? A filtered mask, oxygen mask, right? Either a nebulized or non rebreather to sort of uh, it's going to help treat patients with respiratory issues during uh, the pandemic. So, right. if you want to just kind of give a brief overview of what it is, so that just give people an idea of what it is, and then we will uh, play that video to give people even a better idea. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, firstly, thanks again for inviting me on the show. So I, I'm an emergency medicine doctor, and I'm an asthmatic. And I'm right there in the trenches with all the EMS guys. I mean, I'm, I've been there since, you know, March when we get a patient that comes into the room, and you don't know what's going on, and you're putting all this – equipment on to protect yourself and you just don't know are you going to come out of that room and 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 become ill from that and uh soon we realized that this was an aerosolized um contagion and we decided that to eliminate aerosol medications nebulizers from all the treatments in ems in hospitals in emergency rooms in doctor's offices they're all taken out and so the question is what happens when we get these patients with shortness of breath? How are we going to treat them? We all know we want to put oxygen on them. We all know we want to give them nebulizers. And so we're trying to come up with different solutions. Uh, I got to tell you, there have been some interesting ideas. One was you uh, put a CPAP mask on and you use a viral filter. I'm sure you've seen that rig. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's very impressive. It works. It's super expensive. It costs EMS like... 40, 35 to 40 bucks a pop every single time. Another thing that they're doing is they're uh, deciding to treat patients with asthma or emphysema outside the EMS ambulance so they don't re- release the aerosols into the, the, the truck. I mean, remember, the truck is a confined space, just like an, an, ER, an ER room. It's a confined space. And when you're treating somebody with these, these little fine aerosols and they cough, all that stuff just gets wings and flies into the air. And, and that's how EMS, respiratory uh, personnel, and uh, doctors have been uh, in, infected from the virus. Another idea that they came up with is using those albuterol inhalers. And um, those are super expensive. You know, like the asthma pump? Yep. Right. When, Rescue you know, when people use Huh? Rescue inhalers. Rescues inhalers. Those things cost a hundred and fifty bucks. You you pulling out one? I have. I'm the prop guy for this show. <laughs> yeah. Jim just stands there, pulls all the wrenches and stuff like that. But you're talking about yes. This. So they're doing that in in my hospital. They're doing that right now. They're giving the patients the rescue inhalers. Those little things cost 150 bucks. And you add on the spacer that like helps it get more efficacy, that's another 30 bucks. So these are really expensive options. And um, Jim, maybe you can show the video of what it looks like with a regular nebulizer and, and you can see the particles just flying in the air while, and. Yeah, hang on a second. Show the problem. Are you guys seeing it? Yeah, you can see it. And just imagine somebody coughs when they have that going on. So each of those aerosols just kind of becomes, you know, gets wings and kind of goes into the air. And and that's how these people are getting infected 
when treating patients with shortness of breath? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Let, you know what? I want to I wanna show, too, the, the over kind of the, um, the video that, we, that you did on YouTube yeah. that go, gives like an overview of, of it as well. It's about a minute or so. So I think people get a good idea with that as well, just to kind of let them see that also. Yeah, that's good. Hi, my name is Dr. Paul Lewis. I'm an emergency medicine physician practicing in South Florida. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, we have been unable to optimally treat our asthmatic and emphysema patients when they present with shortness of breath. The reason is our mainstay treatments, high flow oxygen and nebulized medications have caused viral particles to expel into the air and have harmed and even killed healthcare workers. I would like to introduce the aerosolesce mask a typical oxygen mask has an input port for the oxygen and these vent holes for the patient's breath. It is through these vent holes that viral particles have contaminated and harmed healthcare workers. The aerosolized mask is designed with viral filters over these vents. In addition, it also has a special face plate that is engineered to optimize the fit on the patient's face. The aerosolized mask finally allows us to treat patients with shortness of breath and keep healthcare workers safer. Remember, the aerosolized mask should be used as an additional device to PPE and other standard clinical guidelines. What I, I one thing I, I like about that also was the um that face plate yeah i thought that was interesting i have the the prop here so josh you're not the only one with props <laughs> okay so um the, what we did is really a synergy it's a synergy of three different um design uh design ideas and our whole idea is to basically what we call the patient's environment, what's around their face and the environment. So I don't know, I don't want to, Josh, I mean, you seem like a nice guy, but I don't want to see, you know, be breathing your environment. I want my own, my own, my own oxygen, my own air, my own stuff. You too, Jim. So I, I feel like that's something we probably shouldn't be sharing in, in this particular pandemic. We feel the same about you, doctor. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will say, like, like Josh, I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen, like, New York City, they change protocols a little bit um, when it comes to treating patients with, with nebulizers as well, right? Where they, they kind of want you to do uh, the handheld, you know, rescue neb first, using a non-rebreather before you get to the, um, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the aerosol. Uh, nebulizer, you know, to give that nebulizer medication. And the one, that, I mean, from experience to myself, right, when we're called to a house to take care of a patient, most of the time, they're beyond needing just a non-rebreather or their rescue inhaler, right? They need the the nebulized albuterol, calm, calm event, whatever, what you have on your truck medication-wise to give them, right, Josh? And most of the time, when we're called to the scene, we're kind of beyond that that element, right? We're, we're past them using their nebulizer or just using a simple, uh, you know, oxygen, you know, the, the, the forced air that they have in their house, right? So we're already up to the nebulizer part. So I, when I see, like, the protocol change that I saw in New York City, that the advisory they had about that, I'm like, okay, but is this written by somebody who actually works on the ambulance? Because I know when I get to the scene for an asthmatic or, you know, emphysema, COPD patient, they're beyond their rescue inhaler. They're beyond the, right. you know, room air, forced room air oxygen they have in, in the house. They need our oxygen and they need, you know, the nebulized medication. Dr. Lewis, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, and since you worked in the ED, I'm sure that um, there was some, lo some level of transition at which you spied out a couple of your regular medics 
who you knew knew what they were doing and you could go to them before you even interacted with the patient and said, okay, what did you do? I mean, you know, where, where is this at? What do I need? And um, our typical asthmatic call uh, is something along the lines of somebody who had meds, ran out of them, uh, maybe had been harboring a cold all day and then used multiple meds throughout the day. But they're usually there, for, they're usually calling us for that more definitive ALS intervention. That is 100% correct. And um, it's, it's actually, I mean, it's, 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 it's what we can do right now. Well, it's what we used to be able to do. Now we have a new solution. But um, I'll tell you another thing that they started doing, Josh, is they're giving terbutaline injections instead of giving uh, albuterol, which we all know the efficacy of albuterol versus terbutaline injections. I mean, it's like, that's so 1970s, you know? It's funny, I, I've seen that in protocols too, like, you know, giving that, uh, that injection. Um, There's a lot of stuff that's coming off as Hail Mary, so we got to do yeah. something. Some action is better than no action. And sometimes right. just getting the person into a situation where they're not working as hard, where they're not running around the apartment, where they're not in that environment that's really, you know, helping exacer exacerbate their condition, and you're just putting regular oxygen on them, that is usually enough to at least raise their stats and get them into an even more controlled environment. Well, you and the patient, you know, Josh, too, I'm not, that are getting not, hypoxic, right? And you're trying to instruct them to use their own inhaler. Right. It's right. like, it's, you're just, that's doing nothing for anybody. I like, I, I, you know, it's funny that Jim and I sort of saw the same thing at the same time. I like that extra frame that you have right. around the mask. Yeah. Um, we have, and uh, Jim's, you know, once you become a paramedic, you become uh, versed in the art of jury rigging. And we have taken, you know, we've done everything from either make a venturi mask out of a non-rebreather to if we feel that they're really just contagious of something, taping over the holes of the non-rebreather. Yep. Because at least there's, there's some going on and it's 100% pure oxygen. And, you know, there's that, that level game you play. But um, yeah. this, is, this is an elegant solution to a very specific problem. My, my question, if I were to not be completely a cream puff here and throwing softballs, is the idea of, you know, is this another piece of equipment that we're going to want in concert with our CPAP mask, in concert with our Venturi mask, in concert with the three other types of masks that we carry regularly on the, on the bus? I mean, you know, so where does this... So um, that's a good question. And, and I do want to get to that. And I also want to spend a little bit of time showing you the features. Um, to your question, this um, is, we just, we just launched the product. And there are about 15 agencies that have decided to switch over, placed, placed orders, and said that they're no longer using the regular nebulizer mask. So they're taking this off their buses, trucks, yeah, I get that. and they're putting this on. And uh, they just don't want, they want to keep their, they want to be able to treat the patients and keep their guys safer. So that's the decision point. So it's this instead of this. I mean, this instead of this. Um, do you want me to just take a couple minutes to talk to you about the faceplate and how the whole yeah. thing works? I mean, yeah. Is the faceplate something that's, that's um, mandatory to use with that? So... So the whole point of what we made here was a synergy of three things. The viral, we, we, closed, we closed off the holes, right? We closed off the holes and now we have viral filters, a large surface area. So when the person exhales, it goes, the, the carbon dioxide goes through the holes, but the viral particles are not sent. The, the viral particles are kept on their face or any, any pathogens are, are kept in, in the mask area. The second thing we did was we came up with, since this is a closed environment and there's no, it's a moist environment, we have two parts, uh, uh, an absorbent pad here at the bottom, and then we have a sealer pad at the top. 
So remember, our goal is to as much as possible, as much as possible, minimize anything escaping from around the patient's mouth, their respiratory tract. So with this device, what it did, it caused a little bit of back pressure because the path of least resistance is around the face. So then we came up with a face plate to really kind of bring it home. And the face plate, what it does is the way it seats on the face is it takes a mask that was made for billions of people and it makes it suited for that one particular person. It, it also gives, Josh, to your question, what we call a CPAP light effect because there's a little bit of forward, you know, positive airway pressure with this mask on. And so we're seeing um, in, the, in the hospital um, world, we've seen significant improvements in oxygenation with this compared to a high flow. That's interesting. Uh, one thing I, I, I did, I did read something. And again, like Josh said, not to throw softballs and stuff. I want to, I read something about, about using, uh, well, the dangers of, of the neb nebulizer. And it was, it was from a COPD website that I saw. And it was uh, something that the Nat, they said the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence had mentioned that, they advise the continued use of regular nebulizers because administration of medication via nebulization is not considered to represent a significant infectious risk. This is because the aerosol produced during nebulizer treatment is not patient derived, but is generated from the fluid of the nebulized chamber and therefore does not carry patient derived viral particles. And if a particle in the aerosol comes into contact with the patient's contaminated mucous membranes, it will cease to be airborne and therefore will not be part of the aerosol. Now, I don't know. To me, I'm, <laughs> what's the point of wearing everybody wearing face masks and N95 if it's coming out and, oh, there's nothing to worry about? Because I read the rest of the article, they talked about most of the people that were getting infected from patients that were using nebulizers was not from the, the uh, the 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 aerosol from the, the 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 mist, but from touching the mask that the patient touched, or touching the patient, and they weren't wearing proper PPE, and that's why the, the healthcare workers were getting COVID. I'd like to just, I'd out. like to mention one more just field observation that probably all three of us have observed uh, observed at one time is uh, you give the patient a nebulizer, they breathe it in they get a little bit of that medical effect that they feel. What is the next thing they do? They cough. just cough it out. Yeah. Oh. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's why like, I, read, I read an article like that, and it's a study that they, that they put out there, and I'm like, but in, in, when it comes to practical application, it doesn't make sense. So we don't have to wear gloves anymore because they did a study. Yeah, that I know. If it's bleeding, it's on the ground. It's on the ground. Once it hits right. the ground, you're okay. Right, exactly. It's not going to splash up, you know. Well, I mean, we've both been to some gory. Yeah, stuff. just an odd thing, and I, I wonder if you get pushback from that, Doctor Lewis. Like from from, uh, and that's probably not the only one out there that says that. There's probably other things out there. Are you getting pushback of that sort of, uh, you know, train of thought? I would say very, very, very few and far between. And whenever that does happen. I say, I'll tell you what, let's do an experiment. Let's put that nebulizer mask on a patient that has COVID, that's coughing, and have you walk into the room. Are you comfortable going near that mask? Yeah, exactly. That's true. And then, and then you know, we kind of look at the, 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 the way uh, the news has unfold, unfolded, and uh, it was maybe two or three weeks ago that the... Um, CB, CDC came out with a warning, okay, you ready for this? Two weeks ago, viral particles are now considered to be, the, 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 the path of con contagion is now aerosolization. This was two weeks ago. Wow. I mean, I just don't know where they've been for the last six months, but um, I, I don't hmm. know. Well, Let you me, can uh, have guess, but we don't need to get into it here. I 
Well, I just, I personally don't want to be around a somebody that is receiving a treatment and that they're, they're coughing or, or breathing hard. We, they also breathe heavily. You know, they're in, in respiratory distress and, and they force their air out more um, when they're short I, of breath and, and that projects. You know, there, yeah. look, uh, there's, um, we have a lot of different opinions on the show that go a lot of different ways. And I'm not going to beat up the CDC about what's going on. I, I think there are explanations to that. I would like to step back and take a 100,000 foot view on our entire emergency management system, our emergency response from, from inside the emergency room to outside the ambulance doors. And I'm going to tell you that in a lot of things, especially when it comes to, um, you know, viral protection or contaminant protection, we really just run we love the old school ideas. I mean, it took a while for EMS, once gloves were proven to actually add to your safety, it took a while for EMS to really adopt those. There were the old school guys who never worked with gloves and they didn't, you know, they, they found no need, you know, they wash your hands, you'll be good enough. And we have sat for the last, I would say 30 years, with this idea that whatever air we're breathing, our own immune systems will protect us. Whereas if you go to EMS systems around the world, in certain places, especially some of the more denser populations uh, in the, in the uh, Asian Pacific re region, EMS workers, they wear masks. They wear masks, they go in, patient might be sick. You know, even in their culture, their culture is one of protective, you know, this protectionism where they, where I think I might have a cold, I'm going to put on a mask today. Not because I'm so concerned about you, but because I'm more concerned about the public view. It, right. it looks bad if I sneeze and I don't have a mask. Right. And, and so we're, you know, maybe this is a step where we start to roll into those higher level considerations that, even on a good day, without a, a worldwide pandemic, the people that we come in contact with might have a bug that we don't want. I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that mask usage will actually be, even though it has a greater level of resistance, it'll be incorporated more into our daily lives. Think of what that'll do to the flu season, you know, or cold season. I mean, you, you, you guys are going to be sitting in the emergency room saying, uh, I better not have another cup of Starbucks or get me a decaf, you know, <laughs> because you just don't want that much excitement. So let me do this real quick. I want to well, play. I, I just uh, like the idea of wearing a mask. I want to play both those videos that you sent, those short ones of the, with, that, with, with, with the regular nebulizer and then the one with the uh, – with the safety net. The safety net, yeah. All right, I'll play those back to back and you can comment, of course, as, as they're playing, just to kind of show both of them one after the other so people can see the difference. So this one is the regular. You also have to be aware of like uh, tuberculosis. Those other, other pathogens are in the air are, are, being, are coming out when a patient gets a treatment like that. Tuberculosis, flu, COVID. Well, yeah, I mean, Josh, think about how many times when you get a patient that's coughing and coughing and coughing, and you put a you put an army breather on them just to make them so they're not, you know, try to limit what they're getting out in the back of the truck. Are you kidding? I've given uh, saline nebs just to produce more of a cough because yeah. that's part of what. Part of what they need, they need to move air in and out, get some of this junk, you know, clearing out the, of the Let me uh, show the, the passages. Show the video with the uh, the aerosols neb. Hold on a second. Twelve minutes, one and a half cc left. Doctor Lewis, I have some nerdy questions. Yeah. I'm just curious on uh, why you picked this particular, did you pick this mask design because it was readily accessible and you can add on to it? Because it's 
still seems like you had to make some more changes. Yeah, we, we wanted something that we could, as you say, jerry rig or, you know, modify appropriately. We did try a couple of different, um, um, different types of masks and this had some features to it that made it more amenable to the modifications that we that we're looking for and again everything we did was uh, it took months to develop and it's it is a miracle that we were able to bring it to market already um but the 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 parts that we kept going back and forth anytime we would see leakage we would go back and go back and and try to figure out what it took to minimize any aerosol leakage in the environment. And it, it, you know, from the design, I can see that your exhaust ports, um, that looks to be, have some sort of either sonic seal or glue seal on the, um, on the uh, micron, uh, micro fabric to remove the virus. Uh, they look much larger as well. Have you noticed that there's any respiratory changes by having a larger port to exhaust out of? Well, uh, I can tell you you have an engineering type background. Um, so actually the reason we did enlarge the holes was to create a, a, a bigger surface area for exhalation. And, you know, have you done any studies around that specific design change or it was uh, just, you know, a, more of a functional uh, aspect to it? Okay. As a matter of fact, we, uh, I, I don't have my device here, but we did use the um, Acatamax particle counter. And the Acatamax particle counter, when you put a regular neb on, and I used a, a tent, like a, a camping tent, a br two brand new tents. Right. I call it, one was a dirt did the regular nebulizer and a clean tent where I used the safety neb and the safety neb you know these are we're talking tiny little particles 0.5 micron one micron in size so just remember the environment is changing all the time to things you cannot see but there are many times that I used the safety neb and the, the particle count went down or stayed the same or maybe a little bit higher but use the regular nebulizer the particle count is like a Geiger counter from Chernobyl. Sure. Sure. Well, you're just exhausting straight out into the uh, atmosphere. Now, yeah. so now here's a, the second part of the question, you know, in terms of experimenting and sort of finding the right fit and seal. Have you discovered any techniques for yourself, for the practitioner to better protect themselves in this environment? Any huh. trick that you've sort of learned? Well, uh, because I've no, seen no. the double masking and, and where you put the N95 under a regular uh, surgical mask, and that seems to give you a better seal. I'm just you know, um, I actually used one of those big respirator devices um, where I was practicing before. And I have to tell you, uh, Josh, um, it's it's kind of scary in a sense because i think in the beginning and i remember going in to see my first patient like it was it was scary uh, we like put all the garb on and now you know an n95 and and some gloves okay but it's coming back josh i mean i worked last night and we had a couple of patients that were from minimal contact with uh, i'll give you a little anecdote we had an elderly gentleman in the um, like late 70s, and he was being cared for by his younger sister. Um, at home, she would like take him for walks or maybe make him. And um, she contracted the, the virus two days ago. Um, he became sick yesterday and was in the hospital. and. And it's like, you know, when you see somebody that level of sick, you start going back to the full gear of um, the, you know, protective equipment. But when they come in with the, the lighter flu symptoms, you get this false sense of security where, ah, oh, gloves and a mask, you know? Right, right. Well, so, you know, there's I a little feel like there's this burnout that's happening amongst both yeah. the public and healthcare workers where they just, 
you know, I've gotten through this. Maybe I've taken a few, you know, a couple of uh, too many precautions. Maybe the precautions are over precautions. You know, you sort of see that. I mean, we've been studying that quite honestly for 20 years with hand washing. Yeah. Um, you know, and the idea of, you know, I mean, you're probably aware of it, but, you know, how often do you see your coworkers cleaning their stethoscopes? Yeah. It's so there, there, there are these, we have to, you know, one of my other uh, sort of secret uh, 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 jobs was um, not so secret, but I'm, uh, I'm a hazmat tech as well. So I've been oh. trained in these uh, various scenarios and how to protect yourself. And the, the, the big enemy, the always the big enemy, and, and I'll just back up and expand it again to all of emergency services, all of medicine, is complacency. You right. know, complacency both on the part of your part in doing the diagnosis and following through with treatment to our part of protecting ourselves and protecting the people around us. So, you know, that you know, that you need to be sort of shocked back into the reality that, hey, this isn't a joke, even though maybe as the curve breaks down, your your actual patient population that's contaminated drops, but they drop a little bit, that doesn't reduce your risks with any particular patient interaction. That is correct. So, doc, Dr. Lewis, do you, have you seen a lot of patients using this device already so like uh, in the hospital in the ee so so i uh it's a good question we just launched the product just um i want to say about a month ago and um we've just had a number of orders placed because we listed we actually listed with henry shine uh it's possible you people can buy it direct through us or through henry shine and when we listed through Henry Schein, it got a lot more coverage. So people in Utah, Louisiana, South Florida, um, uh, New Mexico, a whole bunch of EMS stations just play this. So we're just getting these out, and you're going to see them on the trucks very soon. Have you have you heard feedback as far as um, uh, uh, increased oxygen consumption or, or decreased consumption of the oxygen with this versus a regular nebulizer or non-rebreather? Or have you seen it where patients kind of have that same reaction when you put a CPAP mask on them where they feel, you know, very suffocated and closed in until it starts to kind of help them? And they can relax so, a little um, bit. We did, we did launch it in the hospital where I was practicing in South Florida. I just moved to California. And in the hospital where I was practicing, uh, we, asked, we had a bunch of patients that received the treatment. And they were asked, does this feel comfortable to you? Does it make you, did, did you feel, you know, like kind of, do you, did you feel, uh, was it claustrophobic? And no one complained about the comfort level. It's not the same level of intensity as a CPAP mask. Right. Um, in answer to your other question, we did see um, a significant increase in oxygen saturation with the, um, the safety net. As a matter of fact, we had a few anecdotes where the respiratory techs would had a patients on high flow oxygen and they put, them, uh, put the safety net on and the oxygen went from mid 80s on high flow oxygen to mid nineties. Hmm. We had patients that were going to be admitted to the hospital, but because they were able to get the treatment with the safety neb, they were discharged home. Uh, we had ICU patients using them. Um, it's so far we've only had positive feedback. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get more patient experiences now that, um, that it's going to be, um, you know, more countrywide instead of just. Uh, is, is yourself or the the the, the other um, agencies selling it for you? Are they are they collecting data for you as far as what you know the EMS agencies that are using it? Are they collecting data on, you know, the provider experience? You know what they see the patients doing, 
you know, stuff like that so they can track it and then give you that feedback to either make changes or. Yeah. You know. So we actually worked with uh, chief Hamill from Lee County and um, he's very instrumental in um, giving direct feedback and um, he doesn't throw soft, what is it? Softballs? Soft, um, softball. I, yeah. softball. Yeah. He's very uh, demanding and I like that. He's, he puts us up to rigorous uh, testing and the same with Paula Coleman from Pasco County. Um, so a big shout out to them. They've definitely been instrumental in helping us, you know, tweak the, the, the All right. so, um, I think with that being said, moving forward, that, that is good to get that kind of data. Okay. Yeah, no, I was thinking one of the things I'd love to see is, uh, 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 you froze up for a second. One of the things I'd love to see is some studies related to, you know, the it basically the application of PEEP and maybe some, um, uh, maybe some studies to say how much this really um, effectively is increasing PEEP in that, in that uh, oxygen and medicine delivery uh, we, that you have. That's a good question. We actually have a, um, uh, I don't want to say the name yet because uh, it's a pretty important person and um, she's a professor and she is going to be studying the effects of the PEEP and, uh, well, I, it's more like positive and expert, uh, a little, little, little PEEP or, or where I should, and she's and uh, she'll, she'll be able to get like specific readings Sorry, on that. Doctor, could you just repeat that last part? You froze up for that. Um, yeah, we have a, a PhD from, um, from a university. I'm not going to say a name yet because, uh, you know, let, let her do her work. And she's studying this um, device on one of those um, simulation dummies. And she'll be able to get readings on PEEP and 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 more more measurements That's like that. And then right. uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Kevin Mackey, who is a medical director for the Sacramento area, has um, requested to do another study. And so he has a research fellow that's going to be um, doing some work on the on this. And we're going to get data. I mean, we're going to get real data that you guys are going to just love because. I mean, we've tested this product in and out. Um, the safety net just really is, I mean, it's just a great device. I am i know it's like, I sound like somebody's talking about somebody's child. So it kind of is my fourth I understand child. That. But um, it, it's, I understand you know, that as an well. ER doc, as an ER doc and as an asthmatic, I got to tell you, it's something that like, we just need out there. We need to be able to give our patients these treatments. Yeah, I mean, you know, as you're as you were discussing it, I was thinking, you know, in terms of uh, the 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 learning uh, curve that we had to go through in the initial COVID response, um, especially with you know the acute uh, COVID syndrome uh, for the lungs. And the idea initially was, oh, the lungs are basically, you know, filling up. We've just got to use more pressure to, to get, you know, oxygen where it needs to go. And that turned out to be exactly the wrong response. So, uh, you know, we call, there was damage caused because of that. And that, that learning curve of how, uh, how people were doing better, doing better with some intervention, but less intervention. So now we have this new device that sort of lives in that intermediate world but effectively does that job better so you know that's what your claim is exactly this is our intermediate device exactly uh we think it's cpap light we haven't quite proven that yet and um but but we will see we'll uh, we don't want to make any you know, over promises, but we will promise that this is a significant development for aerosolized treating medicine, and it, it definitely is going to keep our, our EMS safe to, safer. Well, I have one more for you based on my own experience with 
you know, design and engineering and creating a product and then saying, when I'm getting the product in my hand, say, I could use this tweak. I could use this, you know, just that little bit more. Is there another sort of version in the works or in, in your, at least in the back of your mind that would include a dial, a, a, a settable peep, you know, with a, with a more positive seal, you know, more moving towards that CPAP uh, end of the we, spectrum? We do have some other devices in the works and we really, um, do, not, not, in, not along the lines of what you're saying, but we do have some other devices in the works. Um, okay. uh, I actually, um, an, another person that is, has requested that he would like to study it, who's uh, also well known in the EMS world is Peter, Dr. Peter Antevi. Um, and he is, um, he's hoping to do a study with Dr. Paul Pepe um, at his EMS agency and, and they'll get um, some data. I, they're going to share with um, I think what we have is, is really good in, in, in what it is. And could it, we do have different, a different version, but I don't think it's specifically geared for EMS. This is our, this was more an EMS type uh, EMS or emergency department um, device because it's, it just sits solidly on the face and, and it's more, it's less likely for the patient to take it off and it's more likely for them to get um, their, uh, their treatment than the other device. No, I see that. It was beautiful. Well, I'm not, we're going to end it there guys, if that's okay. Um, Dr. Lewis, I really appreciate you joining us and, and putting this out there. I think it's really a very interesting device and it might even end up replacing, you know, general nebulizers just going forward for everything because it does have that barrier. And like Josh had said, it's the type of thing that can prevent transmission of other things, you know, going on as well, not just, uh, you know, COVID. So um, I definitely think it's definitely something that uh, could be, you know, we'll be seeing a lot more of on the trucks out there you know, in the years to come, like much like everything else that would happen, you know, when they came out the new CPAP, first started CPAP, you had this gigantic box and five hoses and 12 connectors. And now it's just regular mass with a hose that hooks up to the O2 tank. So, you know, it's out there. Um, so thanks for, thanks for coming on, Dr. Lewis. Is there anything you want to mention like before we round it out and end it off? No, I think I think we covered pretty much everything, and I do uh, I do agree with you. I think that um, the idea of treating patients with an aerosol generating device, I think those days are over, and I think it's time to really look at other options like the safety nib. And just in in the EMS world, I think as clinicians, as um, um, companies making products, we really the very fact that they are in a small confined space with potentially infectious patients and that is something that i hope all manufacturers are going to start you know being aware of and putting it seriously on their radar all right well we we'll ended there of course josh i had to do a shameless plug and since we're talking about covid and that people can go get their COVID challenge coin if they're interested. I put a link in the show notes uh, if anybody's nice. interested in grabbing some of these. We are almost out of them uh, from when we first produced them. They really are very popular. With Christmas coming, not a bad idea to grab one if you want to give one for a gift for somebody that was on the front line or maybe even still be on the front line. And you can go to it's aerosollessmedical.com right? And they can get more information about these masks and how to order them and all that good stuff, Dr. Lewis. If it, since aerosolase is a hard name to say, I know. they could just look up safety nab. Yeah. I'll put a link to it in the notes as well. So people can click on it. They don't have to go trying to figure out how to spell and type it all in there, um, make it easy for them. Uh, so I'll put a link to that as well. So people can check that out. All right. So we'll end it there. Um, Josh, thanks for joining us as usual. Yeah. It was a lot of fun, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Lewis, thank you. It was. Uh, I hope that you uh, now that you have this inventing bug that uh, yeah. this is only the very beginning. And one last thing I'll leave you with is: think of us on the bus, 
you know, not just the patient. If there's a better way of protecting ourselves, you got to disseminate that information too. But thank you very much for joining that. Thank you guys so much. All right. All right, guys, everyone, as always, I am Jim Hoffman. Josh Knapp. Stay safe.